This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Chaplains fit that very, very sacred space and have that access to be able to fit in that space and within humanity. And I know that nurses, every nurse I've talked to, I know that if they had the time, they would absolutely spend that extra minute with the patient. I, I know that they would. That's true with physicians, that's true with surgeons, all. And I've, I've met some incredible people who do spend that extra amount of time that they may not have. Um, but I think that's the importance of chaplains and what I've learned in chaplaincy is that we need that humanizing. We need that fitting in between all the medicine and machines. This is the Heart of Hospice podcast with Helen Bauer. I'm talking with Chaplain J.S. Park today about what it's like to counsel and companion patients at the end of life. Whether you're a family caregiver or an end-of-life professional, the Heart of Hospice is here to enhance your hospice experience by connecting you with information you can use about end-of-life care. This episode of the Heart of Hospice is sponsored by Odonata Care. When caring for a loved one on hospice, support becomes essential. Introducing the Care Plan, a path to comfort for the hospice patient, a supportive guide by experienced hospice nurses Nancy Hireman and Brenda Kazire. Nancy and Brenda invite you to experience all that the care plan has to offer. Be sure to check out their free library of care videos on thecareplan.net or on YouTube. Purchase your copy of the care plan today at thecareplan.net. I have waited weeks to be able to talk with today's guest. I was so excited for this interview. Chaplain J.S. Park is with me today. He is a hospital chaplain, a published author, and a viral blogger. For eight years, he's been an interfaith chaplain at a large hospital, a thousand plus beds, that's designated as a level one trauma center. His role as a chaplain includes grief counseling, attending every death, every trauma, and every code blue. It includes staff care and supporting end-of-life care as well. He also served for three years as a chaplain at one of the largest nonprofit charities for the homeless on the East Coast. He has an MDiv and a BA in psychology. He's also a sixth degree black belt. We didn't talk about that. I should have asked him. He's the author of The Voices We Carry, Finding Your One True Voice in a World of Clamor and Noise. His next book on grief is due to be released in May of 2024. J.S. Park, as he's known online, Worked in church ministry for seven years, but he didn't feel like it was a good fit for him. And I think it was the administrative part of things that he felt like weren't in alignment with who he was. And when he had the opportunity to become a chaplain in a hospital, he realized that was where he belonged. That was his calling. We talked about labels and bias in healthcare and how it affects the care of the patients that we provide care for. June believes one of the greatest care interventions a chaplain can provide is time. Time with patients, time with families. And so many of us who work in the healthcare space will tell you that. They really just need our time as an intervention. As a hospital chaplain, June is often at the death of patients, guiding the family on the next steps, and providing grief support at the same time. One of the things he said that really struck me was, he says that an advantage of working with chaplains is they know how to be chaplains to each other. And if you think about that, that's brilliant. Who knows better the work of a chaplain than another chaplain. So to be able to have care from them, debrief, decompress, even just to commiserate about the work that you're doing, who better than another chaplain to understand the work that you do? 
I hope that you really lean into this conversation that I had with J.S. Park, June Park. He's an amazing guy doing some amazing work, and he's got a very powerful voice that's very meaningful. So here's my conversation with J.S. Park. So excited to have you on the podcast today, June. Thank you for joining me. Helen, I am very, very glad, grateful, honored uh, to be with you today. I have been so excited about this interview, and I really want to take a deep dive into the work that you're doing. But we're going to start with just an icebreaker question so listeners can get to know you a little bit. I didn't send this one over ahead of time, so it's a little bit of a surprise to you. If you were at the end of your life, what would be on your list of comfort foods? Comfort foods. I would say both uh, Korean food, uh, for sure, and I think some kind of Cuban food, because I grew up eating that. I was born and raised in Florida. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, so the yellow rice, the black beans, platanos, you know, uh, the pollo asado, some baked chicken, and then maybe some uh, some Korean barbecue. So no junk food. Gosh, if it was junk food, hmm. you know, I, I, I really like just a hot bag of popcorn. I don't know if that's junk food, but I, I would take that too. I, yeah, I don't know <laughs> if that classifies as junk food. It's definitely not something I would have thought as something you would eat as comfort feedings. You know, at the end of life, a lot of times we just tell patients, you can eat whatever you want. But typically it's soft or pureed stuff. Think about it, pudding, ice cream, but I guess it could really be anything you wanted. If you just wanted to have French fries or if you wanted to have popcorn 24 hours a day, you could have whatever you wanted. I like the idea of the barbecue though. Oh yeah. I would, I would want to have that whole, like the, the hot, plate thing in front of me and just grill all my own meats and <laughs> have it <laughs> sitting be, there in front of you. <laughs> yeah, that's all, that's part of the process. That's part of the, the joy of eating that. <laughs> mm, I like that idea. Well, we're going to take a, a really deep look into the work that you're doing as a chaplain. And you've had sort of an unusual journey to getting to chaplaincy. Tell me how you came to work as a chaplain. Yeah, you know, I um. So I grew up atheist and then sort of made a 180 shift towards atheism to go into church and then go into seminary. And my, I think my original goal was I wanted to be a pastor to be in a place where I could help people. And I had majored in psych thinking that I would be a therapist and then just made this shift towards church and ministry. And then I discovered um, at the first church that I worked at, that uh, church ministry coming in as an outsider, it wasn't everything that I had thought it would be. And I think that's true of a lot of places and you know venues and a, a lot of fields of work. But uh, I think for me specifically, I didn't feel like I had the wherewithal or the cleverness to work like church politics, like you know <laughs> behind closed doors type mm -hmm. negotiating with the leaders and figuring out how to look a particular way and operate things, you know? And so, I, because my whole mind frame, and maybe this makes me uh, basic or, I, you know, simple-minded or something, but my whole mind frame is that I'm just here in pastoral ministry to serve my people, but I didn't know about all the other things I had to juggle. There were so many spinning plates and I, I, don't, I just don't think I was, I love my people. I, I don't think I could do, I didn't think I could do the pastor thing anymore. It was, it was just a whole different gifting that took me a while to figure out that I, I was probably not my lane. And so, yeah, almost seven years. And I worked at a second church. I was at the first church for five years, second one for almost two years. So I think I'm making a short story longer, but <laughs> at the second church after two years, everything was going pretty well, actually. And I decided, you know what, even though everything's going well, I'm not sure I still belong here. And I still kept constantly looking through into the church, almost as if through a window, like I was on the outside all the time. Like if I were to read scripture and then see this is what a church is supposed to look like, there was kind of a non-congruence there between what I thought scripture's vision was and what I saw church was. And having grown up as an atheist, I was just always looking in and seeing, does this make sense? And part of the trouble for me was what troubled me 
was when I went into church ministry, it almost felt like the way pastors were preaching and the way Christians that I saw at least were operating were not how can we love more, but it almost felt like they were saying, how can we love less? You know, because I, I came into the church uh, affirming, I came into the church uh, with lots of thoughts about justice and especially coming from an immigrant family. And when I saw the way that the, at least the American church was operating, it almost felt like they were telling me, I, can, I have to love these people here in this particular way. So instead of expanding my love, it felt like they were telling me to contract my love. And I just, that was, that was tough. It was a tough discovery to make over the years. So I left uh, church ministry right before I got married. So when I got married, I actually didn't have a job. And I was um, kind of guest speaking here and there and still confused about where I wanted to go. And then I remembered I spent a couple of weeks um, doing prison ministry. And that's the first time I'd heard the term chaplain. And that was the same year that I had left my church ministry. And so I, I seem to remember that. You know, and it's funny the things that happen like even years ago that come back later in life. It's just one of those providential, you know, sometimes full circle or even half circle type things. And I thought, you know what, when I was there, I really felt like I was doing something within my lane and within my gifting. So I looked it up, found a teaching hospital locally. And that's when I went into internship and, and the residency. I was very lucky because they only accept a, a certain number of students a year, but I had the seminary degree and I, I met all the criteria. And I got in and uh, I remember being nervous and scared and uncertain. You know, the, even the idea of the hospital is very intimidating and daunting, whether you work there, whether you're a patient. And I remember the first um, clinical, um, I saw a patient with a physician. Physician had to break news to this family that their loved one had just died. And I accompanied this physician to break that news. And of course, the grief was hard. It was difficult. And as I uh, comforted this family, as I was, uh, as we say, a non-anxious, non-judgmental, comforting presence, what a chaplain does, I realized um, I think this is the work that I'm called to do and I belong in this room. And uh, it's been eight years later and I can't imagine being any, anywhere else. And it's not easy, it's difficult. Um, but that's how I came around. I took the very, very long scenic route to be here. Sometimes those are the best ones. And I love this ability to look back and say, oh, that was a defining moment for me. I couldn't see it when I was in the middle of it. But now that I think back on it, do you ever wish that you had stayed with prison chaplaincy? Yeah, you know, I think about that all the time. Um, you know, at the hospital that I'm at, it's a thousand plus beds. Um, and we do get patients um, who come from prisons and need like some kind of acute treatment. And so I'm always wanting to see those patients whenever those pop up on our end, we get a consult for that. I, as often as I can, we, it, it'll kind of show the patient and what their designation is. If they are, if they are like a prisoner or coming out of prison, we'll be able to know just from their chart. Um, yeah, I think that is something one day, perhaps, that I would love uh, to do. Um, we're in good contact with uh, the local prisons here and the chaplains that work there, and they do incredible, powerful work. And so, you know, there's something about, um, I, I hate to even say it this way, because so often they're called, you know, the, the, that population or something like that, right. you know, or even the way I said that, that they're designated a certain way. And I do see um, a lot of um, implicit bias and assumptions that are made about the value of life and how much a person is worth. Um, even hearing about how, uh, when we had a lot of travel nurses during the pandemic, they would look at our hospital and say, y'all do uh, code blue, the resuscitations for a long time. And they would tell me at the hospital that I came from, if the person was elderly, if they were a prisoner, if they were homeless, if it looked like they weren't going to make it, the resuscitations would definitely not go as long. Like they could just see it. And of course, you know, that's anecdotal. That's by story, but still they could see it with their own eyes. After a while, you can see that. And so with um, quote unquote, the prison population, 
uh, those who, um, you know, are coming from those systems, uh, I have a special, I, I feel that I have a special heart for them. And I can see the ways in which uh, there's avoidance around that. And so if, if one day I'm called to that, would love to, and I'm always glad and grateful that we get to um, speak with also prison uh, chaplains who every single one I've ever talked to, they're a thousand percent effort for advocating uh, for the prisoners that they serve. And so it's a, it's a special work that we do. I think so. You know, you were talking about this, this label is what I would call it to say the prison population, right? He's mm-hmm. a prisoner. That really is a label. We would say in healthcare, oh, he has a designation on his chart, mm-hmm. but it becomes a label. And then that way we are able to, I hate to say this, we, we designate the kind of treatment they're going to get. We know how much money we would typically allot for this. And I think it does reflect, our care does reflect those labels quite a bit. Yeah. And I think we do that in general with, so say you have an expectation of what a patient's going to look like just from reading the chart. So if I told you the patient's um, terminal diagnosis is cirrhosis of the liver, what's the first assumption? The patient's an alcoholic. Yeah. Or what's the, it's a very derogatory term I've heard, frequent flyer, I think. Right. Somebody who, yeah. who's in and out of the hospital all the time. Yeah, it's a label. And I think that in healthcare, we do that because it's easier to objectify people and put them in sort of a conveyor belt. I think of our healthcare system more as a conveyor belt than it is a continuum. We talk a lot about the care continuum, but Mm -hmm. I see that happening. And I, I think a lot of times we objectify people. We put them in boxes. We have expectations of what they should and should not look like. And according to what we read, then our biases kick in. I mean, some of that's just naturally being human anyway. I mean, I, you know, I, I think I have two maybe layers of thoughts on it. It's like a, both a empathy and a compassionate caution in which, you know, when I see patients that are labeled non-compliant or aggressive, you know, or violent, it's a generalization based on 0.05% of their behavior in their whole life. And I think on one hand, I have at some empathy for the label because I think it's almost like a trying to tell other staff, like, hey, uh, use some appropriate measures when approaching this patient. Right. Cautionary. Uh, because they're right. Because, uh, you know, staff safety is a really big deal. So, of course, we want to exercise uh, wisdom and, and, and kindness and boundaries for ourselves. Um, but I think having that label can do a disservice to the patient as well, because that generalization paints their entire story. And so I have some, I think, empathy in as far as I can understand why those labels are used in a clinical sense. But when it's so clinical that it takes the soul out of that story and that person becomes data, that's when my compassionate caution comes in and says, we need to be careful how much we're compartmentalizing this with this generalization to where we're seeing this person only as a violent offender or only as someone who's non-compliant. And I think there's always a reason for someone's non-compliance. I would say 99% of the time, non-compliance or some sort of aggressive behavior, it's a trauma response. You know, being at the other end of the quote unquote power dynamic in the hospital where someone has needs that are very acute and deep, they're going to at some point uh, lose composure or lash out, or verbalize a lot of distress. Um, They're not going to act, of course, 100% at their best. And uh, I'm not saying anything new or original there, but I do think um, there are times when those labels, I just wish we could do away with all those and be more specific. And I know maybe it saves time or it's a shorthand, but on the other hand, it really does take the the care out of healthcare. It does. I think think it takes the humanity out of the people that we see, that we treat. So let's talk about the non-compliant thing. Mm -hmm. We use that word for community-based patients when they're not doing what we think they should be doing. That's that's the way I've seen it used. You know, a person's non-compliant with their medications for whatever reason. They don't want to take them. 
they choose not to take them. But we make it sound like they're just children that are disobedient. Yeah. In using that word, non-compliant. Patients have the right to choose not to do things, not to participate in certain therapies. That doesn't make them non-compliant. It just means they're flexing their ability to choose. Yeah, you know, and in fact, I would say what I've seen a lot of times with quote, you know, non-compliance is that it's a lot of information gap anxiety. And so if someone doesn't know what is being given to them or what they're being told, they're of course going to refuse out of a survival instinct of I need to be looking out for myself and careful about the treatment that I'm being given. Right. And so, you know, a lot of times it requires an extra effort and extra labor to be with a patient who may be labeled as non-compliant to give them the information that they need in order to feel comfortable with and have reduced anxiety. So, for example, myself and my own family, uh, and I would say this is possibly true about a lot of people of color, um, we may have a high distrust of medical institutions because of the way we have been previously and historically treated. And so my parents in particular, they didn't have health insurance for a long time. And I know people in my own community, the Korean American community, the Asian community, where they have a high distrust of what are these doctors going to do and what can Western medicine do for me? And are they just giving me these pills? What's really in these pills? And so, um, not to step into something too controversial, but even with vaccinations, with some of the disinformation around that, there was a part of me that had a lot of empathy for that because there are people who just by default, naturally, will look at physicians or medicine or look at the the institution as a whole and feel a lot of suspicion around it. And I want to validate and legitimize that suspicion because there are plenty of folks that have been hurt uh, by hospitals and or may feel like uh, healthcare is taking advantage of them. And certainly in our in our American healthcare system, that isn't untrue, you know. And so when I see noncompliance, there's just a deeper story there. And for me, I'm always thinking there's always more to the story. And how can we discover that and get to the humanity of it and sort of exchange information in a way that's safe and illuminating and and when the decision is made, that it is well informed and that they are comfortable and they're at peace with it. So, a lot of times, I think nine times out of 10, non compliance is really just there's an anxiety around a gap of information. And what can we do to close that gap? Do you think a lot of that is related to the time that we invest in our patients really talking with them? Yeah, you know, in fact, that actually just brought to memory. Uh, a quote about the time that we're able to spend uh, with our patients. And this is by Dr. Thomas Fisher, uh, who is a ER physician. And uh, he writes on sort of um, his work as a doctor in the ER, but also seeing sort of the disparity of care with those who are impoverished or with people of color. And uh, this is this is what he says. He says, I see a patient and I know that they're having a terrible day. I know that they're bewildered often, or sometimes they are all too knowing. I see myself reflected in their eyes. When I allow it, I am flowing, but they want to be something more than a blur. They want me to pause for a moment. They need me to stop. This, as much as treatment, is what they've been waiting all these hours for. Patients with a doctor are said to be in the act of being seen. She's being seen by a heart specialist. But do I see them? How can I make it clear in the flow, in the constant movement that they are real to me, that we are here together? They need to be seen and I need to see them just as badly. But time, time doesn't allow it. They have so many questions, sometimes spoken, sometimes implicit. How did this happen to me? Why am I suffering like this? How can I make it stop? And who exactly are you, this stranger standing so close, touching me, seeing me, this stranger I suddenly need? I want to answer them, but there's no time. And um, he goes into this heart-wrenching passage about he wishes that he could write every one of his patients a letter, just kind of compassionately 
um, offering them some kind of kindness or information or an extra labor of love for them. And it, it's so heart wrenching because every healthcare worker I've ever met, I know that they want to spend the time with their patients. And I know that's also true of, you know, within our families, with parenting, with marriage, it's so hard to find the time. And, you know, I know that we, we could, we often say, oh, well, we can make time for the things that are important, but it is tough. It's not just time, but it's the mind space and the heart space. And I guess I'm lucky to be in a position where as a chaplain, I do fit between the medicine and the machines and the people that are kind of revolving around this patient. I think chaplains fit that very, very sacred space and have that access to be able to fit in that space and within humanity. And I know that nurses, every nurse I've talked to, I know that if they had the time, they would absolutely spend that extra minute with the patient. I, I know that they would. That's true with physicians, that's true with surgeons, all. And I've, I've met some incredible people who do spend that extra amount of time that they may not have. Um, but I think that's the importance of chaplains. And what I've learned in chaplaincy is that we need that humanizing. We need that fitting in between all the medicine and machines. Well, chaplains really do have a foot in both worlds. Health, at least healthcare chaplains do. Um, hospital and hospice both because you understand the medical system and the medicalization of what is happening, but you also understand the personhood and the sacredness of what the person, the patient, is experiencing at the same time. Chaplains really do hold a, a special space for things. When caring for a loved one on hospice, support becomes essential. Introducing the Care Plan, a path to comfort for the hospice patient, a supportive guide by experienced hospice nurses Nancy Hireman and Brenda Kazire, with over 40 years of combined hospice experience. The Care Plan is your trusted companion, a wealth of knowledge from clinicians who understand the unique challenges of hospice care. Nancy and Brenda provide practical insights in their book, along with a library of guided videos that offer caregiving tips and techniques to make caregiving easier and simpler. The Care Plan isn't just a book. It's a source of strength for those who navigate the challenges of caregiving, ensuring that every moment is embraced with compassion and care. The goal of Odonata Care is to transform the end-of-life experience through education and support. Nancy and Brenda invite you to experience all that the Care Plan has to offer. Be sure to check out their free library of care videos on thecareplan.net or on YouTube. Don't forget that the Care Plan is also available in Spanish. Purchase your copy of the Care Plan today at thecareplan.net. I've read some of your writings where you say, you describe the job of a chaplain as a grief catcher, a hmm. grief catcher. What does that term mean to you? Yeah. You know, I think I, I mean it on several levels where a lot of times I'm, I'm literally catching people as they're grieving, you know, as they're falling to the floor or as they weep. I'm in a sense, metaphorically um, catching them, catching their tears. And a lot of times I'm catching stories um, I'll often ask in rooms after a loved one has just died, um, can you tell me what this person is like? Or can you tell me what your loved one is like? And 99% of the time, they're more than willing to share the story of their loved one who's just died. And even though I've never met them alive, in some way, um, their family makes them alive by the story that they tell. And so in some way, I'm catching that story of grief. And in their grieving, they're remembering and honoring and uh, I think also there's a sense in which when I catch grief, I am vicariously experiencing what they're experiencing. And even though I'm a stranger in this room, even though it may often be the first time that they've ever met me and I've ever met them, there is something about grieving with someone, even when they're a stranger, and that person validating and being with and being present, not lecturing or giving lessons, but simply just being there, where when we catch grief together, it makes it bearable somehow. Um, there is a Vietnamese phrase, phrase I've heard that's used for consolation, it's chub one. And, you know, in English, there's a phrase, I'm sorry for your loss. That's a kind of typical consolation. Yes. I think there is a Jewish phrase, uh, may their memory be a blessing, which I really love. 
uh, but the Vietnamese phrase chia buan means uh, we divide our sadness. Oh. And I think, yeah, which is um, heartrending and beautiful. And for me, I think catching grief in that sense, if we can widen our cup together, we're able to bear this together. And so I'm catching their story and in some way I'm catching those who are bereaved. I love that. You carry it with them so it's not quite as heavy. Mm -hmm. And that's empathy. For anybody who doesn't work in this space, I think it's hard to maybe understand what that's like. Um, empathy is a hard concept. But that's what that is. And you, you not only carry it, you actually feel it with them. You grieve with them. So, June, when you think about your day-to-day -day work as a hospital chaplain, what does a typical work day look like for you? Oh, gosh. So... Um, we are at a thousand plus bed hospital and a level one trauma center. And, um, we also take in hospice and we have, uh, like, a palliative suites. And so, uh, we chaplains typically will get consults that pop up for us. And on any given day, we can have dozens of consults where we would be called to a chaplain, uh, to a patient who requests a chaplain. Uh, for crisis assistance or comfort. They may have a theological question, but I would say many of my visits, we don't even bring up religion at all. They just want somebody to be able to vent to, to tell their story, to kind of process something. Um, they've just been told a diagnosis that's going to completely change their life. And so um, certainly there are nurses and physicians, even social worker and psych who can sit with them but it's the chaplain where we fit that intersection of mental health, faith, and medicine. And so we sit with our patients and offer that comfort. We also do advanced directives, which is about um, signing a healthcare for, signing for a healthcare surrogate and the living will. And so that's assisting with end of life care. And those are very sensitive, delicate conversations to have because right. designated healthcare surrogates essentially saying, uh, this is the person that I pick to make decisions for me in the case I can't make decisions. So in that sense, we're already sort of talking about our, our mortality and our frailty. And the living will is about, here are my wishes if I ever end up on life support, artificially prolonging measures, what I would like then. And the document talks about the things that are okay to remove. Those are very, very difficult conversations. And at least in the hospital that I'm at, they assign chaplains for that. And we work at the level one trauma center. So we respond to every single trauma. Um, whoever's working the ER that day, that chaplain will carry a pager. Um, I didn't really know what a pager was until I started working at the hospital. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say. Uh, but I thought, oh, that that's cute. And it started beeping. And I'm like, oh, okay. There's a message here that's coming in. I'm maybe showing my age a little bit. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but uh I, I would, uh, you know, we get the pagers, we go to the ER and the traumas that come in, since we're level one, we get the stabbings, gunshot wounds, car accidents, drownings, fire, fall, stroke, electrocution, uh, all kinds of things that would be very high acuity cases that require a trauma team immediately. And so they come in by air or by ground, sometimes by boat. Um, and when they come in, part of our role, if the patient is awake and alert, we offer them comfort and counsel. Um, and if they're not, or even if they are, we reach out to family for them. And I have to make that phone call. Uh, your loved one is here at the hospital. And that's a really tough phone call to make, of course. And uh, I meet them often at the front door uh, in the lobby. And when possible, I will guide the family to be at bedside of their loved one. And so we attend every single death as well. We talk about next steps. There's a kind of an informational component. But there's also the grieving component where we are grieving with, and if we can, we offer some sort of comfort or ritual, whether that's a prayer, whether that's last rites. Um, we have Catholic priests also on site who help with that as well. And so, as you can imagine, it's a wide range of activities. Um, we are never not busy. We do staff care as well. Um, we respond to every single code blue. If there's a resuscitation, we're the ones who call the family to alert them. There's, there's a crisis event happening. Uh, a code blue has been called. And so, um, yeah, every, every moment is filled with crisis. It's constant. And since I'm at such a large hospital, 
I feel like I'm inside a mini city. I have a very specific window into suffering. It's just this microcosm of everybody's worst day. And uh, chaplains, we we fit with all the the emotion and humanity of it. You know, when I accompany a physician to break the news that their loved one has died, the physician will very gently go over all of that and the family will, you know, react how they're going to react, uh, whether that's screaming or silence. And uh, often after the physician is done answering questions, the physician has to go back, you know, back to the ER or back to, you know, doing their rounds and things. Right. And the chaplain stays and I stay with the family and I stay as long as they need whether that's going to be five or 10 minutes, they may ask for privacy or they may want me to stay for three hours. But that's part of the, here's the physician giving the information and the chaplain is the one who helps with the pieces. And so it's a tough role. That's about my day to day. Um, and that's probably about, maybe I give you about 50% of what I do, but it's tough. And wow. that's, that's about an average day. Yeah, I can feel the heaviness just in that little bitty description. I can feel the heaviness in what you do. So that's really a good segue for the next topic I wanted to touch back on. How do you take care of yourself? Yeah. After a day like that, you're not just taking care of patients. You're not just taking care of families. You're taking care of your coworkers. Yeah. So how yeah. do you take care of yourself after a day like that? You know, I just wrote on this today, I think online in a, a tweet or a post or something, but... You know, when I get asked about self-care, I think there's like the the maybe normal answer, which would be like, you know, diet, sleep, and exercise are important. I have a therapist. Uh, I believe in medication, community, nature, listening to music, hobbies. All of those are really, really important things, and I, I try to do all of them. Uh, I'm just glad to be within community, and I'm I'm glad I work with chaplains because they make the best chaplains, you know? And we get, we get to process together. Yeah. But to be truthful, Helen, I, I, um, there are a lot of times uh, I do just fall apart, you know, and uh, no amount of self-care can quote unquote normalize the work that I do. It's just so hard. So if anything, there are times when it's so overwhelming what I try to keep in mind is not to shame myself for feeling how hard this is and how heavy it is. You know, like we're seeing with all of the, the global chaos right now and reading headlines and news of just so much loss. I think there's part of us that we really do need to take care of ourselves and be kind to ourselves in all the ways that our body needs. And it's going to be specific for everyone. At the same time, it's hard for me to just read the news and then turn the page, you know, and I feel it. And so I would never want uh, taking care of myself. And I know this is not part of the question, but I wouldn't want taking care of myself to be a way for me to just tolerate what's happening and, the, and to keep going. Even, on, even over the weekend, I had such a hard shift. And when I got home, uh, I didn't get a chance at work to really sit down and really feel it. But when I got home, um, took off my tie and uh, my wife was awake and I just burst into tears. And I, I literally could not stop uh, for about 10 minutes. You know, my wife just held me. And, um, you know, maybe from the outside through a window that doesn't look like I'm taking care of myself. But that was some kind of way that I was able to just uh, care for myself by feeling the weight of it. Um, I didn't want to bottle it in. I didn't want to hold it all. You know, I held it together just long enough for the shift itself. But I think for healthcare workers, for people who are first responders, educators, therapists, wherever we're working, we do need those moments where we just say, it's okay to feel the weight of this. And I think that's where I'm at currently where I'm doing all the self-care things that I know how to do and also not shaming myself for when I feel it in my body and it emerges and I express myself in the way I need to. Thank you so much for being so vulnerable and sharing something so personal. I think we do need to find these places that we feel 
safe enough to have those responses. Mm -hmm. Because there should be boundaries on how we conduct ourselves when we're in the workplace. But when you get home, to have a partner, a friend, a family member who can sit with you in that moment the way your wife did, I think it's very healthy. It, maybe tears are a form of self-care. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. So I want to change focus a little bit. You have a very robust spiritual life, and you work with spiritual counseling in your, your job. And you write some really powerful blog posts about faith and spirituality. You talk about inclusion. You talk about death. And there's a quote from one of your posts that I saw. You say, I have a litmus test when new theological movements pop up. Will it matter to one of my dying patients and their families? Hmm. And you said, but that litmus test has simplified and clarified my faith. I still make a mistake, but always I have a reminder to myself, if it doesn't work in the end, it won't work in the start. If it doesn't work for the wounded, it won't make you whole. If it means a lot of arguing and posturing instead of compassion and action, I'm too tired to care. Leave it out of the patient's room and keep it on your platform. It's very powerful. So how do you think working as a chaplain and providing spiritual counseling, spiritual care for those who are dying, has changed your beliefs uh, and shaped your faith? Yeah. Um, can I say, first of all, when you read that back to me, I was like, wow, that's really strong. <laughs> I must have been, I must have <laughs> been like, uh, yeah, I must have been really activated that day. Yeah, you were feeling all the feels that day. It yeah. is, it's very powerful. Yeah, I well. Thank you. I I I'm, I'm I was listening to it like oh, I can't remember having written that, but um it does yeah, but I've certainly felt that. I've certainly certainly felt it. You know, it's um just a comment on that part real quick. I think sometimes when I'm in the world of of grieving and loss and then I go back online and I see a lot of the the bickering and back and forth. On one hand, I have a lot of compassion for that. I think a lot of people online are acting within trauma response, you know, out of trauma response. Sure. And so um, it's not that they're necessarily by default just mean people. Um, everyone's acting out of some kind of story. Yes. Um, on the other hand, there is this, I don't want to say cynical part of me, but maybe a part of me that wants to stay grounded and uh, my feet on the ground, and my feet on the earth, and just look at all this bickering and just say, what a, um, what a sad and unfortunate way to spend our time online like that, um, to argue about this sort of thing. And especially when it comes to, to theology, there gets to be a point sometimes when I go in the comment section, which I, I shouldn't do, but the arguments and discussion, they get so granular and they slice it so thin where I'm like, gosh, is this really worth investing so much of our heart space and mind space to? And maybe maybe I'm saying that out of cynicism uh, or pessimism, but there is just a lot of online arguing, especially theologically, where I'm like, you know, does this really matter? Because I keep thinking about my patients every time I see stuff like that. And I'm like, would my patients go online and go into the comment section? Would they get out of anything out of somebody who is theologically right, you know, who is technically correct yes. in their theology? And so uh, what you had read, I, I think it's true. I think seeing so much death has really, truly simplified and clarified what I think, um, what I try to see is helpful for my patients. I think of my patients first. Anytime I see theology, anytime I see somebody writing something inspirational, anytime I'm reading a book, um, a, a self-help book, you know, or something like that, I'm just always thinking, well, would this work for my patient? And if it doesn't, um, then on one hand, I want to consider, well, maybe this is for a different audience. Uh, but on the other hand, if it doesn't work for my patient, I, 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 I'm not sure that it would work for anybody because all of us in some point are going to experience loss and crisis. And so the thing I've learned most of all is 
I don't want a, a faith that I have to hold up. You know, I don't want a faith that I have to prove. Um, I don't want a faith that I feel like I have to theologically win. I don't want something I need to hold up. I need a faith that holds me, that holds me up, that holds me together. And so sometimes when I see people arguing on, online about, you know, whether it's religion or politics or this or that, or about church stuff, uh, about ministry, sometimes I'm like, how much does it matter in the end? And if it doesn't, does it matter here right now? And um, at time, I, I don't want to sound like I'm above anyone or condescending, or I, I don't want to sound like I have it right and they don't. It's just, um, you know, if I could, if I was like some sort of a politician with actual power, I'd probably have everyone work six months at a restaurant and then six months at a hospital. <laughs> and we might all become better people, you know? I agree. And I've been, yeah, I've been a busser at a restaurant. I worked as one for five months. And, you know, now I've been a chaplain for eight years. And it really does just crystallize for me and for my coworkers, what is most important. Yeah. We could talk for another hour about all of this. I, I hear what you're saying. There's incredible power in it. What I have seen with spiritual counseling and, and really for anybody who works in the healthcare space, for us to be able to hold our own beliefs and our own faith very close and very dear and never compromise it by respecting someone else. That's the balance that we deal with every day. And I think sometimes I wonder if we see it as a threat to have a patient that has a different belief system, a different faith, different religion, and it's out of alignment with what we believe, or at least that's our view of it. At least that is our view that their belief is out of alignment. And we can't support that because it somehow compromises or takes away from our own faith. And I don't think that's true. Yeah. I can absolutely support a Muslim, a, a Jewish, a Buddhist, an atheist, a Wiccan patient, and never mm -hmm. compromise my own beliefs. What would be your thought about that? Yeah, you know, I think if anything... I mean, on one hand, I've lost my faith a couple times working at the hospital, and I've always come back, and I've come back changed. But I do think working with other faiths and backgrounds, relig you know, upbringings, and different traditions, heritages, that, if anything, has strengthened me as a person, has strengthened my faith. If anything, has helped me to understand myself and to, and to really connect with the divine. And... Um, you know, because I work with all kinds of different folks of different religious backgrounds. And um, when we talk, I, I just, for one, I just love hearing about all the different ways that people do connect with God. And I, there's so much that I can derive from that and get from that. And to me, it's all beautiful. It's just this tapestry that we're all painting with different brushes. And I never feel threatened by it. Uh, I'm, I'm always like interested in learning about it. Um, but you know, there's another thing where I, I, I read this, I think, uh, by C.S. Lewis, he was part of something called the Oxford society, I think for a semester where people of different religions came together and sort of maybe not argued, but I had dialogue about what they believed. And what C.S. Lewis said was eventually what he realized was every single person of a different religion had a different idea about what the other person's religion was. And they realized that they had a very weak and small idea of what the other person's religion was until they actually heard what they believed. And by hearing the best version of what that person believed, or I don't even want to say best version, but really hearing how that person lived out their faith was almost kind of like, I can see why they believe that. And I can see, and it also in some way strengthens mine because it fills out for me things I didn't understand. And so, I just love kind of the beauty of that whole passage where he's talking about by all of us being able to have this open dialogue together, we all became stronger in our own faith and could love each other even more and respect each other even more because we all understood where we were, we were coming from. We all had these misinformed half ideas about each other. 
And so even, even things that I feel like, oh, maybe that's not theologically helpful. Like, uh, I'll visit patients once in a while where, where they will, like, for example, there was one, and I'm changing details just a little bit, but he had a diagnosis that was terminal and he kept saying, but I trust God. I trust God. It's God's will. And for me, that's an immediate, like, uh uh-oh, maybe this person's glossing over it and sugarcoating it. So I'm going to try to get deeper so that they can embrace the sadness of what's happening. So I said, oh, that that must be really tough, you know, to to trust God through something like that. You know, trying to name it, you know, take what he said and then name the thing, the hard thing. He said, no, I I trust God. I trust God. This is God's will. I said, well, yeah, well, God's will can be really, really tough to understand sometimes. And we went back and forth like that. And after about maybe three, four minutes, he was unwavering in his trusting God and this being God's will. And I could tell somehow in his composure, the way he was saying it, that he really, really was leaning on that. And then I thought, what if I'm doing a disservice to him and something out of my own perception of that isn't helpful? And and maybe he did land on a place of peace, that he really did just trust God and that was God's will and he was okay with it. And I thought, you know what, if that's working for him, for me, if it works, it works. Right. And, you know, and maybe later it would cause some trouble or he would have like a, you know, existential crisis. But in that moment, I did end up just saying after three, four minutes, you know what, that's so wonderful that you are leaning on God this way and uh, that this is giving you strength right now. Uh, I'm so grateful to hear it. And uh, we prayed a prayer together and it was, it was a wonderful visit. But part of my brain was like, oh yeah, are you sure you trust God right now? I wouldn't, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, if this is God's will, it's not a good plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just like, oh, I don't know. And, you know, like hopefully we're, we're not saying that at everybody, but at least for this specific patient and some of the patients I've met, I've heard that. And I don't want to, I, I want to on one hand say, hey, let's explore that and think through that. But then I don't want to contradict them if they're really, if they've really made peace with what their faith and their framework is telling them. And so chaplaincy and working among colleagues of different uh, beliefs has really stretched and expanded me to try to make my heart big, like like wide enough, my arms wide enough, a grace big enough to hold all of it, to make space for all of it. And to understand that where this person is, it may not be where I'm at, but I do want to meet them where they're at and to validate that. And if they move this way or that way, I'm gonna go with them. You know, I don't want to pull away from them or contradict them, but I will travel with where you go in that journey. Wonderful. June, how can my listeners connect with you, read your blog, find you on social media? (laughs) Yeah, I'm on all the things. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Instagram, uh, Facebook, I think it's still called Twitter in some places. Yep, I'm on all the social media stuff. And uh, yeah, I, I, I have a tendency to respond to all my messages. I know I shouldn't, <laughs> but I love to engage with people. So if, if you reach out to me, I will try to respond. Thank you so much. You're, you're doing some great work. Your voice is powerful and strong. Don't soften it or silence it. Thank you, Helen. Appreciate that. Appreciate you. June has a really strong internet presence as J.S. Park. You're going to be able to find him on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. He also has a website. There'll be a link in the show notes to his website. You can read his blog there. It's some very powerful stuff. You're going to want to connect with him. Be sure to catch the next episode of the Heart of Hospice podcast. You can find more episodes on theheartofhospice.com. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. You can connect with the Heart of Hospice on Facebook and Instagram and send your questions or comments by email to helen at theheartofhospice.com. And remember, no matter who you are or where you are in your hospice journey, you are the heart of hospice. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time.